got a question for you. And Fenrir is sitting there in his prison, bound, and he sees the sun pass over him. What does he say? He says, one day, I'm going to wolf that down. Often the sun and the moon are not personified in the Norse understanding, but the poetic Edda references a man named Mundilfari, who had two beautiful children named Sol and Mani, and they would be counted among the Aesir, and in heaven they run across the sky so that men can reckon the years. Now there isn't very much else written about them, but this isn't to say that they were unimportant. On the contrary, they may have been central. There are two deities of the sky. There is Dok, or Day, of the Aesir, who rules the day. And then there is his mother, a Jotun named Not, who rules the night. The moon and the sun are presumed to be heavenly bodies that are just in the sky, and the sun is said to be pulled by Skinfraxi with his shining mane. Not is said to be pulled by Himfraxi, who leaves dew on the ground as he passes. So here we see a, a Danish artifact from the Bronze Age that seems to show one side gilded with gold, possibly depicting Day and Skinfraxi, while the reverse side might show Not and Himfraxi, or some local cognates of these entities. It likely would be some other name or cognate, as the artifact is currently dated to 1400 BC, but it does show that the record that is kept in the Poetic Edda likely references a very ancient story. Yet, Many heathens do follow Sol or Suna as a deity and make offering to her. Mani as well is worshipped in this way, and offerings are given to him. So what is the story behind these two gods? Our windows into these deities are limited, but Snorri gives us an interesting story and a window into what the Norse may have believed. Now Snorri's account is similar to the Poetic Edda, but with little differences. Now he discusses how Sol and Mani were born to a human Mundalfari that in his pride he named them Sol and Mani, after the sun and the moon. But the only reference that we have for the timing of what happens next is that Sol was promised by marriage to a man named Glenn. The marriageable age of Norse culture was around 15, uh, so we can assume that it happened around then. But it was at this point that the gods punished Mundulfari's pride by taking his son and daughter and placing them in the sky with the corresponding celestial bodies. The reason for this is a bit of a mystery, even with the description. The text seems to reference plainly that Sol and Mani are taken because of the prideful act, which seems to reference the arrangement of the marriage to Glenn. The problem is, is that we don't really know who Glenn is, or what's forbidden about him. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the sagas or the Eddas. And some prefer to see the prideful act as the naming of the children after these celestial bodies that this in and of itself was the arrogance, and that it doesn't really have much to do with this mysterious man at all. Personally, I, I wish we knew who Glenn was, as it would shed some, uh, <laughs> some sunlight onto this mystery and perhaps give us some clarity as to why this was seen as a prideful act. Perhaps their names were an attempt to fool someone. Perhaps Glenn is another deity, as Snorri often refers to the gods as gods, but he does also make them humans in some cases, or tell the stories as if they were. And this case could be no different. But alas, any way to find the answers to these questions is long gone, buried in time. Sol was made to drive the chariot of the sun. The chariot now has two horses, according to Snorri. As day rides Skinfaxi through the sky, Sol now deals with Arvak and Alsvin, who pull the chariot across the sky. And she receives the kenning, the Shining Goddess. Now, this is my assumption, but the story sounds to me like she's the older sister. To clarify, this isn't in the story. My only reasoning for this is that the sun is older than the moon. Mani, too, is given a task. He guides the moon across the sky and is in charge of its waning and waxing. And two other children, a boy and a girl, we can assume of similar punishment, follow Mani with a pole and pail, having come from a well, presumably with water, seemingly stuck as eternal children in the sky. Now, whether or not this is a punishment is kind of up to interpretation, isn't it? After all, Sol and Mani result with dominion over the sun and the moon. This punishment aspect is one of the things that Snorri seems to just import into the story that doesn't really fit with the image of heathenry that I'm familiar with. It's possible that he's referencing an existing concept, but it does feel very much like an imported Christian ideal into the story. As such, the real nature of the story, or the originating nature of the story, or whatever it is you want to call it, 
may have something more to do with the forbidden nature of Sol's betrothal to this mysterious Glen that could easily have been a drama among the gods. Perhaps Sol was a deity that was already betrothed. Again, these are questions to which we will not know the answer. But give me your theories in the comments. How do you see Sol and Mani? What is your perspective on this story? Let me know your thoughts. To me, this story of Sol gives us the image of a young woman or goddess finally coming into her own that is suddenly in a little over her head. Going from one moment of betrothal to the next as the shining charioteer of the sun, driving flaming horses across the sky, separated from her brother, who she can only see when the sun and the moon are in the sky at the same time. This separation is further realized when we take a look at the sun and the moon from our own modern perspective. The sun still moves, just a little differently than those in the Bronze Age probably thought, as the sun's chariot races around the Milky Way rather than the Earth. She's far away from the moon, which is guided by Mani, who is yet always able to see his sister except during a lunar eclipse. Day and Nought are closer to the Earth, circling the pale blue dot, as night and day are dependent upon the Earth's perspective. And then there's Sol, far from us all, driving the chariot of the largest celestial body of our solar system. And now Sol has become immensely powerful. Offerings are given to her as she sustains the earth with her gifts. The rays of warm light she ensures, and her gravity that pulls us around and around her, giving us the seasons which dictate our harvest and our festivals. Then the earth spins, giving us day and night. So much of our lives rest upon the sun, such that if she were gone, or we were torn from her, her way of life could not exist, and we would have to find a way to adapt to the cold darkness, or we would die. Which brings us to those who threaten them. The wolves of Fyndra's brood chase them. Sol drives her chariot onward as the wolf Skoll chases her. She is powerful, but a little frightened. Mani and the other children are chased by Fyndra's namesake, Hati Hrodvitnason. As Sol looks on helplessly, devoted to her task of driving the chariot as the wolf skull grows nearer, she looks to the earth and sees as Hati draws ever closer to her brother, ready to kill him, covering the sky with his blood, releasing his father, Fyndra. At which point, what does she do? Does she continue to run? Or perhaps she may turn and fight? I hope you all enjoyed that story. It's one interpretation of many. There's variety in people's impressions of soul and whether or not she would be depicted as young. Mani as well. I've, I've seen uh, several depictions of him where he's seen as older or even that they mature while they're on their journey. And there are suggestions of this as well. And you might take the position that Snorri's image of them as originally human isn't what was contained in the earlier legends. And I might agree. Uh, I think it's entirely reasonable to assume that he just made that part up. My main question would be about the betrothal and whether or not that had any real hand in the earlier manifestations of the myth, which might imply Sol's youth, possibly even as a deity. Sol's fate is briefly mentioned in the Poetic Edda, and there are many ways of looking at what it might suggest. In a duel of wits with Odin, the wisest of Jotun, Vafthrudnir, answers Odin's question about the fate of Sol, since the Jotun knows of Ragnarok and the prophecy of what is to come. And he responds that she will fall, not to Skol, but to Finrr, but that it will not be before she bears a daughter, as radiant as she who will continue on her mother's path. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. Shine a little light on the subscribe button and punish the bell for its pride. And remember to find a way or make one. <laughs>